Right. I, need to take, I need to follow suit. I need to follow that example. Good. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And going to Matthew 21, we all know this is the, the week of Passover. Mm -hmm. So I figured it'd be appropriate for us to talk about this. Oh, wait a minute. Did I put the wrong stuff somewhere? Yeah, there we go. All right. And so, um, so I thought I would talk about this because it's just some of the, the assumptive things that we see with, with people. Um, and really, it's also addressing some of the things I think we need to address as far as leadership. So here in verse 21 of Matthew 21, it says, When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage in the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats, and most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road, and the crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Um, this verse 10 is supposed to be on the next frame, but I messed that up. So anyway, so just addressing this thing here, first of all, when Alexander the Great or some kind of a conquering military hero would ever take over a city, a similar image would take place, but they'd be riding on a horse. And that was to say, we have dominance over you, you know, and they would do the same thing with the palm leaves and everything else. That really is a sign of subjection. And, and he would be receiving a tribute from everybody. 10% of everything he had would go to the conquering hero. And so here, uh, this isn't just to fulfill a messianic prophecy that we see here of him riding on a colt, on a donkey. It's also a, the reason why that prophecy was in there. It was, it was uh, revealing the heart of what God wants as a leader. And that is somebody who's a servant. A donkey was not considered something to be... Um, uh, lifting people up above one another. It was a common um, uh, tool for everyday work. So it's like I'm, I'm coming in in humility. I'm coming in as a servant. I'm coming in as a co-worker. I'm coming in as one of you. So that servant leadership is a key thing that we need to be doing when we come in. So that was, that was a key thing that was supposed to send a message and it did that's when you'd start seeing people um panic judas started to panic because his whole goal and this is the battle you run into anytime you, you have leadership or you come into leadership you better be really rock solid on who you are because what you're gonna what you're gonna realize is pretty soon the people that are following you you're gonna find out why they're following is some people are following you because they're expecting you to do something for them. And when that doesn't happen, they're going to turn on you faster than you can say, go. If they are um, following you because they have an agenda, in this case, they wanted him to be a military hero. The, the verbiage, Hosanna, son of David, uh, is something that you proclaim to somebody who's conquering. All right, this guy's coming into town to kick the teeth of these Pharisees and the Romans, and, and they're going to tear this thing up. That's not why he was coming in. So many of the conjectures of Judas's betrayal was he was trying to find a way to get Jesus to 
be around the Pharisees so that they could unite and they could collaborate on how to defeat Rome. That was their agenda. That wasn't his agenda. And those thoughts started to come into play now when he came in on a cult. In a separate verse, a separate version of this, you hear him coming in this way. And that's what's interesting is, you know, uh, the Pharisees start, you know, start saying, tell them to stop saying this stuff. And he goes, if they don't say it, the rocks are going to cry out. So he's recognizing what they're saying needs to be said. But at the same time, when he comes into Jerusalem, he starts to weep and says, I wish you were like, the, uh, you know, I wish you were chicks that I could gather together, but you wouldn't have it. So at the same time, he's recognizing they're doing what they, they need to do. He's like, nobody's really recognizing me coming in as the way I'm coming in. And so um, there's a lot of times if you are put into a position of leadership, people will start trying to define for you how they want you to lead. And you better know what your role is as a leader. Uh, you know, in business, I've had people, as soon as I was a leader and they, want, and they saw, you know, me having influence in these areas, then they wanted me to do this or this or this for them. And uh, that was not my role. In fact, I know that would be detrimental to the team. And so they would turn on me, man. They would say all kinds of nasty stuff because I didn't do what they wanted done. You know, and, and that's the stuff that will cause this thing to fall down like a house of cards if you start, um, there's, well, let me say it this way. When we see this in politics, there's many leaders who really aren't leading. They're putting their finger in the air, hoping to see, you know, where the wind's blowing so they can do something that'll appease the masses. Leadership can be a very lonely place because you've got to have an inner driver. You've got to have an inner compass that's guiding you because you're going to have people that you think are following you that aren't. And they're, they're using you. You know, I know years past, there's people I thought were my best, some of my best friends. But as soon as my role changed, I never saw them again. And I'm not saying that to whine. I'm just saying, you know, as soon as I was no longer somebody that could do what they needed done, there was no reason for us to still be friends. And so you need to recognize why people are doing it. And that's why I feel like in Jesus' leadership style, he had them follow them, follow him, live with him, build relationship so he could understand the motivations of why they were following him. Does that all make sense? Sure does. All right. So... So then we get to uh, him coming into, into town. He had entered Jerusalem. All the city was stirring. Who is, the, who is this that the crowds are saying? This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, the reason why they're all up in arms and really high on Jesus at that point, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh. So he had done some fancy thing to get everybody all excited. Now, Here's another thing that's interesting. We think, okay, doing miracles and doing all that stuff is going to turn the world upside down, and they're all going to follow Jesus if you do that. You know what the Pharisees' response was when he raised Lazarus from the dead? We have to find Lazarus so we can kill him. Because they're following Jesus instead of us. And so when you step into your leadership, the other thing that's going to rise up is you're going to have other people that are positional leaders, meaning they've been given a role or a, they've got a door, a plaque on their door. Mm -hmm. They are going to oppose you because you're a threat to their territory. Mm -hmm. Even though that's not what you're trying to do. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. All right. So, but then Jesus, he knew what he was supposed to do. And verse 12, it says, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. 
right after saying that. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children that were shouting in the temple, Hosanna, the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said, yes. Have you ever read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany and spent the night there. So first of all, he didn't look to win a lot of people over. He was operating out of the direct heart of God. Is What they were doing is because in the Torah, it, said, you know, it talks about you know, how, how do we need to worship God. In the Talmud, which is the rabbinical commentary, so to speak, of the Torah, and this is how we worship God, it says, you know, we've you know, we got to do the spotless lamb. You know? um, and, and here's why that was happening at that point. They were supposed to, originally, examine the lamb. This is the day, in the week of the Feast of Passover, they were supposed to examine the lamb to see if it had any spot or blemish. It was supposed to be a pure, unspotted lamb in order for it to be able to be sacrificed. Why? Spots and blemishes are considered sin, and you need to have something without sin to sacrifice. Well, then, as mankind tends to do, when there are certain requirements of what the sacrifice needs to look like, then you got some guys that are, or ladies, that go, well, you know, we can make some money off of that requirement. We can tell somebody whether it's unspotted or not. So we're going to take a market on this. You, can't, you cannot sacrifice any lamb. Unless we say it is without spot or blemish. Okay, so basically saying if you want to make sure you've got the right kind of sacrifice, you've got to buy it from us, then it'll be certified, pure, so that you can sacrifice it. That's what was going on. I don't know if you ever knew that's kind of what was happening in the temple there. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it also seemed like people are just the ones that would buy from them. Well, we'll wait till we get there. We'll get it there. Yeah. We don't need to go find it for ourselves. Well, because what would happen all the time is you bring your own. They go, oh, no, no, this one's got a blemish on it. You're going to have to buy one from over here. Yeah. It was a way to make some money. I wish I could say that changed because I was at the Wailing Wall in 1997. Okay. It's supposed to be a holy place. And uh, I'm standing at the wall thinking, well, I should pray, I suppose. So I was starting to pray. And then, uh, you know, Hasidic Jew guy with the curls and the hats and all that, he comes up to me and goes, sir, 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 this is closer to the original place over here. And he pointed to a wall underneath a tunnel underground. I went, oh, that's kind of cool. I'm just seeing where, the, where that goes. So I thought, okay, he's just helping me out. As soon as I got to the entrance of the tunnel, he holds his hand out and says, $5. So he was guiding me to, to a new place to pray so he could make five bucks. So I wish we could say that this has changed, but it hasn't changed. All right. So he's overturning the money changers tables. This is another thing is a lot of people think if you're going to be a godly leader, you've got to be you know, nice. Let me, let me tell you something. There's, if you do a study out of Galatians five, when it's talking about the fruits of the spirit, it talks about kindness and goodness. The two different words. And I'll just tell you right now, the two, if you try to say, I'm operating in all the fruits of the Spirit at the same time, that is physically impossible. Because some of them contradict one another. Not that they're contradictory personalities, but they're for different uses. For instance, kindness. The Greek word for kindness means to smooth over, to mellow out, to calm down. That would have been the word that you could use when Jesus was with the adulterous woman. And he says, where are your accusers? And she goes, they've all left. He goes, yeah, yeah, they're not here. Neither am I. I will not accuse you. Go and sin no more. That was kindness. He smoothed over a volatile situation. This situation right here would fit under the word goodness. Because goodness said to incite for the good as one of the definitions. So you can see kindness and goodness are two things. This situation right here, he can't be kind and good at the same time. 
I can't smooth this thing over and mellow it out. I'm actually making a bigger mess. I'm inciting something. Does that make sense? So, so Jesus isn't being good right now. No, he isn't being kind right now. He's being good. Right? So, um, there's times when you've got to do stuff as a leader that's not nice, but it's good. It's the right thing to do. And you've got to be able to take that stand knowing that not everybody's going to like you for doing that. If you ever, if you think my, I want everybody to like me, give up on the desire to leave because you'll never make a decision that everybody's going to like ever. You've got to be doing out of your own internal clock. You've got to know what it is I'm supposed to be doing if I'm supposed to be leading something. And he takes it even further. He goes through the prophecy of the barren fig tree. Now in the morning, when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it, bearing no fruit. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, and you will receive. So first of all, the fig tree, uh, you know, this might tick people off, but it was a prophecy of the of the of the people of Israel, um, you know, at that time, and um, and the fact that there was a transition coming to play because he was exp he was doing this because he saw that they were going to reject him. This was all starting to come to pass because what was what was I wasn't I said about the first day of Passover? The first day of Passover was when you examine the lamb. So what's happening right now through all these little details that we talked about? Jesus is being examined. He's examined by the Pharisees. Stop these kids from saying that to you. Hey, out of the mouth of base. I'm not stopping it. You know, and the more and more he's being challenged because they're examining him. They're not what they want. They're exactly what God prepared but they're not what they wanted. So the main, the main focus here of this fig tree thing isn't the curse. It was the authority that he had, part of the examination. Even though it may be true, because we see this transition from the nation of Israel to the church after his resurrection, I know there's some people out there, even some Messianic believers are going to have a fit. I just said that. But um, I'm afraid it's true, is, is the church isn't a blip. And the, the, the people of the promise are those that believe the promise. And, uh, and all you've got to do to be part of the promise is to believe. So he's telling them, um, if you have faith and do not doubt, what you see me doing, you'll be able to do all this. Now people say, this, is he talking about literally taking up a mountain and casting it into the sea? Well, let me give you some clarity to that. You can say that was a metaphor, but everything that you're going to have authority to do are things that God's going to tell you to do. And I'll tell you this. If God told me to, to uh, speak to a mountain and tell it to be cast to the sea, then I believe it would happen. But it's really about whatever God tells you to do, there's going to be authority to step into it. It's not that he's empowering you to do whatever you want. He's empowering you to do what's in the heart of God. All right, so authority challenge then. When he, in verse 23, it says, When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing. I love this. He always answers a question with a question. Which, if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to this, then why do you not believe him? Because he said, I am the Christ. But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. 
So here's their reasoning. They're going, if we say yes, John said this guy was it. So we're busted. If we say no, the crowd thinks this guy's all, all that in a bag of chips, and the crowd believes John was all that. All that did was reveal that their leadership was not leadership. They were not leading the people. They were political. They were taking a census of what the people wanted, and that's what they were going to be. That's not leadership. We are in a crisis in this nation for leadership. So they said, we do not know. He said, okay, very well. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So he's taking a strong stance now as a leader. He's saying things that he know is inciting a riot. He's being examined. They don't know that they're examining him as the spotless lamb, but he knew it. He knew this wasn't going to be a, a fun trip. Because just in a couple of days, he's going to have the Last Supper. He's going to be betrayed on the same day. So this is something that um, is a perfect example of leadership. The week of Passover is beginning. It starts with the examin examination of the Lamb. Then it goes into the Last Supper. Then we have the crucifixion of Christ. You have the High Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then you have the weekly Sabbath of um, the normal routine of the Jewish community, and then you get the resurrection of Christ after that. Everything changes after the resurrection of Christ. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus when he rises from the dead. He hands that all to his followers. Where at this point, he's not operating in, in all authority, but he is, he is operating in, unauthority, in, in authority, but not all authority. We know this later on because he talks to Pontius Pilate. He says, you would not have any authority over me if it wasn't given to you by God from above. So he admitted at that point he did not have all authority. He does have authority, just not all of it. After the resurrection, he has all of it. And the thing that drives me crazy is the church today has all authority if they're totally submitted to walking with God. And we don't use it because we don't know that we have all authority. That's the deception that we have as a church is all authority in heaven and earth. Well, Bill, we'll have authority when we go to heaven. No. He says all authority in heaven and earth is mine, says the Lord. Therefore, go and make disciples. That's our mission. I don't see a lot of disciples being made today. And that is what we're supposed to be doing with all the authority that we've been given. And I'm getting kind of intense on this because this is something I believe very strongly. But, but that's, that, this is something that uh, I think is, is a critical issue of the church today is we, we, are, we are in desperate need of, of leaders, of people that carry authority and really are dependent on, on Jesus. And, and that's, what he's, that's what everybody was getting offended by at the beginning of the week of Passover was the level of authority that he carried. And it wasn't the authority that they wanted or it wasn't the authority that they carried. He was doing something that nobody wanted. None of his followers wanted him to um, be the sacrifice. They wanted him to be a military leader. None of his opposition wanted his miracles or his message, because it meant they were going to lose their job. So he walked in the midst of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and nobody saw him for the mission that he carried. Could you still do your mission, even as everybody around you is trying to manipulate it and change it? Nobody there understands what you have to do. So they're trying to get you to do what they think you should do. How many of you would fall into the trap of just appeasing them instead of standing alone, which is what he's doing right now? Any questions or any thoughts on this? Well, I can say in answering your last question, I, if it was just me, I, I know I would fall. I, I would falter in that, but by having my mentorship, by having my prayer, by having those around me, by 
purposely putting those around me that I know can help me stay that focus. I can, I can get past those that are trying to manipulate the situation, but by myself, I wouldn't be able to because I, I wouldn't have that confidence, but through him, through your mentorship, through, through these Bible studies, through the study that I'm doing, mm-hmm. um, I can. Yeah. Never so, work alone. And it, it, and we, we need to keep it from being washed down. When you're saying you're, you're getting kind of passionate, it's like, well, keep going, keep going. Because we, in this day and age, in, in our spirituality, in our, our, our uh, government, in our community, we can't have things watered down anymore. Right. That's, that's when the enemy starts to sneak in and, and convincing people of his lies as truth and they're false. So we can't have it watered down. We have to be strong in it. We can present it in a way that will help them to see it without smacking people on the head. But sometimes they do kind of need a little. <laughs> oh yeah. Any other thoughts? You know, the, the, I'll just leave it at that. But one other thought I always have had that's just a, another thing I find interesting about Resurrection Day, Easter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, though I use Resurrection Day, I don't use Easter personally because Easter was a spring pagan festival for, for, for worshiping fertility gods. And uh, that's why you have rabbits and eggs because they're fertile. And so when the Catholic Church went to these villages to uh, get them to line up with the Catholic doctrine. They just embraced some of their pagan holidays so that they would do what they wanted them to do. So that's where we got the celebration of Easter instead of the resurrection. So but yeah, I'm not going to sit there and fight over it. Just, right? Is this a happy Easter? Yeah, yeah, you too. But that's the reality of it. But, you know, even in the Christian faith, we see people really focus in, you know, even like, you know, The Passion of the Christ and movies like that. They focus in on the sufferings of Christ, which is profound. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that at all. It's profound. But you see very little focus on the resurrection. And the reason we're able to operate with authority today is because of the resurrection. The new life is the promise. The suffering is not the focus. It's the life and the power and the authority he wants us to walk in as believers to be salt and light to our community, to the world around us. He did all this to hand his authority to us, and we don't even focus in on that. We focus in on the sufferings, which we need to focus in on because they're profound. But why not an equal measure? Do we not focus in on the power of the resurrection? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, amen. All right. Any prayers? Anything we can pray for? No worries. So, Father, I, I just pray right now for everybody listening here live and also those that will be listening to the recording. As we go through this week and remember what you did for us, Lord, that you would you would just give us clarity on how we can walk and what you've given to us because of this. So Lord, I ask your blessing over each one that we can step into the authority that you want us to have as leaders to impact the world around us. Amen. And I'm just going to tap a loose end real quick is um, the last statement I said, is that all authority to heaven and earth, his mind says, the Lord, therefore, will make disciples. That's out of Matthew 28. And there'll be some people say, yeah, they gave Jesus the authority, not us. Well, that's not true, because in Romans 8, it talks about the power of adoption, and everything that was his is now ours. Mm-hmm. The transfer of wealth is declared in Romans, and we have his authority, because we are sons and daughters of God. Yeah. So we just need to get to know him. So we, we know where he wants to exert his authority, and we go do that. And that's the role of the church right there, is to respond to the things God wants to do. The role of the church is to, to go to a building every Sunday at 9.30 or 10.30 and listen to a message and then go home and eat pot roast. That's not the role of the church. The role of the church 
is to hang out and know Jesus to a level and to a degree that we can respond to the things we know is on his heart to do. Mm-hmm. And then have the authority to expedite it. That's the role of the church. Operating his authority. Bless you all. Thanks, Bill. Have Thank a great you. day. You too. See you.